right, folks. So today we're dealing with World War II and the U.S.'s role in World War II. All right. Okay. To start us off here, you all have your shapes in front of you. We call the tangram exercise, or it is quickly being known as the shapes game, and that works all right as well. We'll play two rounds of this. We'll play two rounds of this. All right. What I'm looking for for first round here, I'm looking for a shape or a, some kind of a diagram using your shape that conceptualizes the U.S. strategy in the European theater. U.S. strategy in the European theater. I'll give us three minutes. European strategy in the, in the uh, uh, U.S. strategy in the European theater. Here we go. What a great day for Vaughn, not the year, right? All right. So we've got to think about this here. What was... Oh, wait. It's a U.S. force in the year. before America came into the war, Britain and France, France was being taken over by Germany. Britain was struggling. And then once D-Day came, the kind of America stepped its presence in the European theater. What was the tactic for taking back Europe from uh, German and Italian hands? What was the how was the strategy that we used? Oh man, didn't they? They like they basically surrounded them that's all exactly in front. Right. They, they they captured them completely around. They cut off all trade. That, they did. That's exactly right. That's made them in one little area. Like a large siege, if you will, yes. Germany. I think yeah. that's how I go with that. Yeah. Yeah. The value of having, well, the value I think of even of just my the shape of my classroom, how I design my classroom. Let's be frank here. The design of your classroom communicates to students what they what you want to get out of them. My class is in a semicircle or half moon shape. So it says to them right away, I'm looking to create an antiphonal kind of classroom where there is communication between them. But each grouping well, uh, are grouped into four, which allows me to, if I want to have groups of four, that's great. They're also paired next to each other. If I want to have groups of two, that's great as well. Uh, the, the value of groups or having them communicate is that whereas one student lack may lack something in knowledge, the other student may have picked something up and they can teach each other. I find quite a bit as just passing around them, listening to them, they will, in many cases, serve as the teacher of objective facts, often where I may miss something over and miss something altogether. And afterwards, you can see after the invasion of Germany, because uh, Germany was so focused on Taking down France, taking France. Germany is focused on Russia and not focused on the British and the Allies. So, and after the invasion, they had the British and the Americans to deal with along with the Russians. So they're yeah, 50 seconds left. 50 so seconds. 50 seconds. Much on the east side, what and they then, and then when they when they invaded, when D Day happened, and a lot of the Russians advanced, and then a lot of the Americans advanced because Germany had a war on two fronts. Yeah, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. We have 15 seconds, 15 seconds. Ten seconds, ten seconds. Five seconds, five seconds. <laughs> All right, go to work, go to work. Uh, activating background knowledge is very important. Uh, it allows them to see how today's lesson is linked from where we've been and to where we're going. So they need to see the genetic links, if you will, between the relevancy of the, of the lesson. Otherwise, students are very smart. 
they can recognize whenever you've just made something up for the day and there's no relevance to what they're doing. But if they see that you're taking them somewhere, that we're on a journey, and this is one more stop on the road, it's worth their time. So, uh, that, and that's, and they need to know as well where I'm going with the lesson. What's the culmination point? And that's what the question on the board helps out. Okay, so we want to think about European strategy or U.S. strategies for taking uh, back the European front. Uh, things that I think about whenever I think about the European theater, if you will, would be the containment strategy and the endeavor to, of course, take uh, sweep in through North Africa, liberate uh, Italy, and eventually, of course, by 1944, uh, D-Day, in which we liberate France. And, of course, on the Eastern Front, we should always think about Russia with Stalin pressing forward into Germany, essentially like, like we have containing this, uh, pushing Germany back. So let's see what we have here. Uh, assuming this is exactly where we're going with right this, at this point. We have the U.S., of course, sweeping upwards. We have also uh, eventually proceeding northwards into France and eventually pushing into Germany with the Battle of the Bulge. And, of course, on the other side, we have Russia. Containment? Yeah. Nicely done. Good stuff. Okay. <laughs> is this the U.S.? No, that, that's, that's France. France. This is that's France. That's the ultimate goal. But they, to get the ultimate goal to invade France, they went through North Africa, then Italy, and then to France. And that's the, so the star is it's the ultimate the, it's goal. the ultimate goal. That is well conceived. Very nicely done. Nicely done. Okay, so small goal to larger goal. Is this the U.S. right here? Yeah. Okay, so the U.S. is proceeding forward from North Africa. Let's see. Italy? Of course. France? <laughs> yeah. And the big goal? Germany. Germany. Nicely done. Good stuff. Okay. Mm, okay, this is very abstract here. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, okay, I need some help here. It's a foot. It's a foot? Yeah. Hold oh, up. I see it. It's Hold a up. I, Okay. 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 So, so it's a. One at a time. That's that's a leg. That's okay. the leg, and then that's the foot with the upside down triangle. Is, right? is this the an star, ankle burner? The, well, it's like saying that it's the allies. Oh, the okay. They're putting their foot on Europe. Huh? Foothold in Europe. Oh, foothold in Europe. Yes, oh. that's good. Yeah, good. Nicely done. That works. Okay. <laughs> They are bombing Tennessee. <laughs> they are bombing Germany. Germany. Germany, okay. So this is a key part of the strategy, right? They're going to go through, soften up the land with bombs to make it easier for the infantry to move in. Uh, good. Works well. Yeah. Yes. Is this the idea of proceeding from one point to another? Is this the U.S.? Yes. Okay. And they're moving forward to France? No. Okay. That's them pushing Germany back in Stalingrad. Ah, oh, interesting. Interesting stuff here. And this is uh, Germany. This is Germany. Okay, yeah, good. Ah, nicely done. <laughs> nicely done. All right, now for the, I think that's probably, the second one's probably the easier of the two, I think. So I've asked you for the U.S. strategy into Europe. It makes sense now to ask you about the, uh, the U.S. strategy in the Pacific. Get your shapes. Three minutes. Here we go. Oh, my God. I'll tell you, it's actually a Chinese game called a tangram game, and it's used in geometry a lot. So I'm always trying to bring in other, the shape game game, the shape game is essentially a, a way of getting them to think abstractly. Uh, I'm always trying to bring in different disciplines into my subject so they can see the relevance that history has tentacles, if you will, across disciplines. And here's a case where it allows them to bring, bring in their geometry backgrounds and think in ways that may be more than just drawing or writing things that are clear. I want them to think, think in terms of symbolism as well. And if they can conceptualize that way, I can create deeper thinkers. Okay, Alright ladies, what's your plan here? What are you thinking? Um, how we, like, Their strategy, and like a big portion of the strategy was taking over the islands that are in the, in the Japanese area. It's like, so it's not we were going to... Yeah. Going yes, in. that's okay. exactly right. The, the method is called island. Island. Good. Like, what are you thinking there? Expansion. So you also have a containment strategy there, stopping the expansion of Japan any further in the Pacific. Yeah, I like it. It's good. Good. Alright, ladies, what are you thinking? Um, 
Well, they uh, basically went through the Pacific and take out, took all the small islands leading to, to Japan, and then once they got there, they used the B-29s to bomb them. Yeah, that's where island hopping, island hopping, island hopping, good. All right, folks, what are you thinking here? So these would be islands like they're island hopping, and then after a couple of just arrows, arrows air around to, it, uh, like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, good, that works. Like right here. Yeah. What's the plan here? We have we, a ship, yeah, and, yeah, we have two islands, and then Japan. And Japan. Okay, so once again, so, they're proceeding to... Good. And the naval dominance of the United States within the Pacific. Does this work see we have here in terms of what we're thinking about or what you're thinking about uh, in terms of the US strategy for uh, liberating the Pacific I'm going to assume here that this is is this Japan the ultimate goal yes okay uh, it's they're like island hopping to Japan and then when they got close to Japan they bombed them and that's oh. the plane bombing it. <laughs> Okay, well there we go. That, that's perfect right there, right? You got the main vocabulary part in terms of island hopping, which is the strategy. And of course, how it ultimately culminates is with the use of the atomic bomb at the end. Good stuff. Same concept here. Is this island hopping moving eventually towards the main goal, Japan? Yes. Yeah, it does have kind of a look of the... Uh, War of the Worlds. War of the Worlds as well. Nicely done. Good. Yeah. It is, yes. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, we're moving towards Japan. Is this a is this a vessel of some kind or? No, that's Japan trying to expand, and that's supposed to be an X, but the magnets don't really cross. But so we have Japan <laughs> trying to spread out in the Pacific for more resources, and they're being blocked here yeah. by the uh, well, at least the U.S. at this point. Good, I like that. It's good stuff. Okay, island hopping again. Okay. Till you get to Japan. Yep. And I see two of these. I'm going to assume Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Yep. Yeah. All right. So very similar over here, but still, <laughs> it's the same concept. It works well because it's correct. Nice job. Uh, okay. <laughs> this is a boat. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, they have island hopping and naval dominance to take to, down to take the island. And I like the fact you actually separated your points out because, of course, that's exactly what happened. They are moving all throughout the Pacific, liberating both the Philippines as well as in the northern area, Okinawa, places like that, to get to Japan. Nice. Good. Okay. Is this Japan here? No. Is this the U.S.? No. <laughs> is this the Pacific? No. Okay, is this a circle in the middle of, the, of, a, of a whiteboard? Big bomb with arrows. A big bomb with arrows. And it is going... <laughs> Okay, so right here? That is a U.S. flight, the ship. Not the ship, the airplane. Oh, I see. It is dropping the bomb. On Japan. That works. It better works. It, it's fantastic. Well, now I'm curious in terms of how, why, why the bomb has wings. More deadlier, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. All right. If it has wings, it's deadlier. Uh, there you go. Engineering uh, insights. I like it. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're going to collect our shapes in a second. All right. Real quick, once you get back to your seats, we're going to put on the videotape, it, uh, the, the video series. It's only 13 clip minutes long uh, in terms of World War II. Uh, from the Crash Course series, we've used this series before. And I'll give you the overarching question uh, before we start so you'll know what you're looking for in the video series, right? Get your shapes, pack them up, we'll go from there. All right, this is the fast talker, folks. So, of course, we've got to keep up with him. But uh, it's also... Uh, as always, has a great deal of a wealth of knowledge here. Here's your overarching question that I am looking for. Uh, I'm looking for the impacts 
of World War II, the impacts of World War II. Hmm? In, general. In general. Why I'm doing this here, this isn't going to talk so much about the U.S. It's just to give you just an overall idea of how World War II unfolded, what were his motivations, and then we will begin cutting into the lesson, if you will, as we go uh, throughout and get more in terms of the U.S.'s role here. But I just wanted to give you just an overview of what World War II was about. I have a game plan for each class um, and change things up. Uh, I, every cl my, my classes, I try not to keep them the same, uh, looking the same way. Every three or four classes do something different. Sometimes I have just debates in classes. But you want to keep the students off balance. Uh, you don't want things to become boring because if it becomes, if it becomes boring for them, they're not going to be interested in history. Okay. See what kind of questions you have? Because it's really fascinating. You think about U.S. history. This is one of the prime highlights of U.S. history is World War II. All right? I mean, this is whenever we become, post-World War II, a superpower. If you have that eighth-grade suit strainer, I'm not even going to acknowledge your existence. We heard a lot about World War II from movies and books, the History Channel before it decided that swamp people were history, the incessant droning of your grandparents, etc. We're not going to try to give you a detailed synopsis of the war today. Instead, we're going to try to give a bit of perspective on how the most destructive war in human history happened and why it still matters. Okay, here's what I need. I need three questions. Three questions regarding the video. It can come from your notes. It can come from uh, something expressed in the video, a question put out by the video, or a question... Okay, find your best question, please. Find your best question that you have, the one you're most interested in. Find your best one. Once you have it, on the board, on the board. This take, in terms of why students feel free about their study of history, this takes a couple of weeks, uh, whenever the class first begins in August, for them to get comfortable with speaking. I think a lot of students come into class used to the hierarchical mode of teaching in which one, the history teacher just tells the student, this is what you should know, deal with it. And their opinions are never really raised because they're, they, they're viewed as being meaningless. Um, so once they begin to realize my opinions actually matter here, if I can justify them, things typically take off pretty well. Okay, look at the questions please on the board here. See which ones stand out to you, which ones you want to deal with here. We can talk about them. You think you have one? Raise your hand. Kyle, go ahead. Uh, in your opinion, when did World War II begin? In your opinion, okay, when did World War II begin? In terms of when did the marking point is for the start of war? He gave us about four or five different options, right? Mm -hmm. What do you all think? Which ones sound the most convincing? Aaron? I think the invasion of uh, Poland is the most convincing because that's beforehand that was more of a preparation for war and that's the first you see a um, more of a major movement of a world power like a military movement okay now I wonder if that's is that your is that is that very European centered at that point it was is it the first maybe start of the European start uh, of the European start of World War II? yeah because um, at, at that point that means that there were conflicts in China with Japan but so it would have been, it's more widespread, it's more of a world war at that point, not just a uh, dispute between two countries. And after that point, uh, Germany continued to expand into uh, other countries. Uh, Nor okay, it's in Norway. That's fair. Kyle, Andre, good. Also, with, I'm agreeing that the invasion of Poland, it brought Britain and France into the war, unlike the invasion of Manchuria and China by the Japanese, it didn't really spark any allies to attack. Japan. So it's basically that it, it was a start of war, but that was just a war between China and then Japan. And then the world war started when Britain and France ended after the invasion of Poland. Do you think the perception was that because Japan seemed as if it was on the other side of the world, they didn't seem yeah. as much as a threat? Was that also, they weren't a real world power at that time. They later on became a world power, but at that time they weren't really. They weren't really a world power like Britain, France, and the U.S. So they were still second tier. They're, yeah. Okay, that's fair. And just like in World War One, though, when like Fran when uh, Germany took over the Suez Canal and everything from France, they got involved. Everything in World War One happened when the European nations started fighting, and by Germany taking Poland, it also started fighting again in World War One. Okay, that's fair. 
Yeah. I feel like that was kind of like two different wars. Like, I feel like I can't relate as much to Japan and Germany as I would like. I feel like Pearl Harbor started the Pacific part of the war and then Poland. I think, this is, I think this is a great comment. Can you make the case that World War II is not one war, but actually yeah, two separate really wars? Yeah, it didn't really seem like two wars. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. who else was Japan fighting? Besides the besides the British in Burma and the Australians and the eastern part with the British colonies, the United States pretty much solely fought yeah, in yeah. Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So without the supply lines, it would be hard to distinguish between, or not distinguish, it would be uh, hard to combine the two. It was the supply lines and the information <clears throat> well, that I, was going across those lines. I do wonder if Russia is the connecting point. So how's that? Okay, so, well, clearly in the West it's easy to make the connection, right? What's their concern in the East? Yeah. Uh, uh, they, um, didn't Russia had already spread down into China with a communism, and then if Japan went in, it would have forced Russia out. And they already had a score cell because of uh, the Russia, yeah, Russo-Japanese. Russo -Japanese. Yeah. The Russo-Japanese war that, uh, there was that bad blood in 1905 after Japan beat Russia, the first time, by the way, that a Eastern power had beaten a Western industrialized power. So there was some bit of honor to regain for the Russians. We're gonna uh, other questions on the board? Let's get at least one more here before we, we move on to one of you with. Daria. What was the treaty between Germany and Russia? It was a non-aggression pact. Yes, the one that, uh, of course, Hitler breaks before Stalin. Because there's a classic political cartoon, by the way, from about 1941, <laughs> with Stalin and Hitler walking hand in hand. And behind both their backs, they have a gun waiting to pull on the other. And they're both walking towards oil fields. All right? So the idea is that if Hitler wouldn't have turned on Stalin, or Stalin would have done the other way. Stalin would have invaded Germany because he even said it himself. He thought Germany wouldn't be totally prepared to invade Russia until 1945. So they were stocking up. You can see the Russians were stocking up militarily, but slowly, and then the Germans just blindsided them, attacked them first. I, I want you to wrap your head around the loss of life in Stalingrad. Two million people. That's Jacksonville two times over. Uh, was it seven days? It was seven a days. very short war uh, a battle there. Uh, and 20 million overall. Right. Yeah. But did Russia have the military might? They had caught up to some degree through Stalin's uh, five-year plans, but they were still behind. That's what I was wondering, because I, I feel like they didn't invade Germany because they weren't ready. Like, they weren't ready to do it at all. They liked the frontal assault a lot. They just liked to throw a yes. bunch of people out of one position and then... I mean, there were there was even in Stalingrad there was guys who didn't even have guns and they just run up, rush these German positions, machine gun nests. And yeah, Ulysses Grant would have loved to have Russia. Would have loved to have Russia at his disposal. <laughs> it, was, it was their kind of. Kind of oh, um, I know in World War One they didn't have a lot of uh, railroads, but did had with the five year plans had Russia expanding their railroad system because they it's a very big country and they have a lot of people, but it would be hard to move. They had, it, they had it caught up uh, very much so in terms of their, their industrial uh, might, in terms of railroads as well. Uh, again, still not where other Western countries uh, would need to be, but uh, they were well beyond the point where they were in the 1920s when they first started the five years. Okay, one more question. we got to move on. Yeah, I'm going to ask my own question. Okay. But why do we hear so little about the other countries' involvement, like Canada and Argentina? Yeah, I didn't even Like, why do we involved. only? Yeah, yeah me like, either. I wasn't aware. Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, this is exactly why uh, folks have begun the, the, the course called World History has started up, I guess, in the past 10 to 15 years or so to, to really think about what are the connections with other countries in global events like this. It's more than just about Europe. It's more than just about China. It's more than just about Japan. It was a, literally a global war. So we're just now starting to get more and more efforts put out to think about what was the impact of how was South America involved in these wars? How was Africa involved in these wars? So it's a great question. Yeah. To go off of that, like, um, is there was there any significant changes in these countries after uh, <coughs> contributing? Like they said, Argentina put forty percent of uh, British's food, Britain's food during the war. I think I think the biggest impact post World War in these these uh, non industrialized countries or non westernized countries, for example, in Africa, is the decolonization movements. The idea of saying, okay, you 
you've liberated the world to make it free. We want to be now we want to be free. And that's exactly what happens in Africa with these various liberation movements. That's a great question. One, two. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they say that it's, it's said on the video that um, Canada lost more people than the U.S. did in the war. But like, I'm in an ass in per capita, just like not essentially. In general, though, is it? A, do we hear li little about the other countries' involvement because the war? They people consider the war to be generally between. The world, powers. the world powers. I think I think it comes down to a study of history. Traditionally, history has been very Western focused, and U.S. history has been very U.S. centered. I think it's just because the Eurocentric nature nature of studying history for the past however long, hundred years or whatever, has been focused on uh, uh, the primary powers as opposed to the peripheral powers. So we're just now starting to get that. What was the purpose of Canada entering though in the first place? Like, did like Brenner as appeal to them? Like, hey, we need some people. Can you like? join us or like did they just decide that it was morally like obligated to join like why did they join in the first place they're part of the commonwealth yeah they're part of britain yeah because they are britain's people yeah. Canada is part of britain's. it's it's hard to explain but basically essentially they're their own country but they still recognize the monarchy mm -hmm. yeah. that's essentially like yeah. still, still, monarchy. still monarchy still there's a monarchy but spread but of it democracy it's not no. that spread of democracy <laughs> All right, uh, Brown, should I set your study guides. Let's talk about the U.S. involvement in the world uh, war specifically. I love Mr. Kaysen, are these pictures from Captain America? <laughs> well, they just seem to make sense for this study guide. Here, so. <laughs> Hold up, what's the All right, the study guide is I post on my website usually about a week in advance. It goes with the chapter, usually about six or seven questions. And again, they are focused questions. They're not just really what kind of questions. They gear t students towards the most essential points of uh, the reading. Uh, at the top of the study guides, I generally put images, usually political cartoons. But we're dealing with World War II, so I knew that a lot of these students, they were probably Captain America was on their mind from, uh, I guess, the last summer's movie. So I pulled out some Captain America propaganda posters. And uh, lo and behold, every class has come in. They, they've had a positive remark to it. So it's just a simple way of trying to get their interest in other For example, how I frame one of these questions, to what extent did Roosevelt as president experience an expansion of power as a result of war? That's an opinionated question as long as they can back up their arguments. Another question, agree or disagree, the American use of the atomic bomb on Japan was unnecessary and excessive. Again, it's open-ended based on their argument. Uh, yes or no kinds of questions don't press the extent of critical reasoning. They've got to be able to show why they believe. We're producing citizens here. That's the end goal. We are producing citizens for the future. And they've got to know whenever they vote in the future why they're doing it, not just because someone looks a certain way or someone uh, uh, holds a certain belief. I want them to be able to substantiate their claims. Here, number one, to what extent did Roosevelt as president experience an expansion of power as a result of the war? Now, this is interesting because we think about the Great Depression as being the expansion of presidential power. We can make the case that a war actually expands executive power more than social events. But we'll get to that question in a second. Yeah. Well, in this case, he had to prepare the country for total war. And with stuff like the War Powers Act of 1941, it allowed him to have like, a wider range of power, that which he was allowed to use to bring about like mobilization of US population and economy. And he was able to like, establish boards to control labor and prices and production. So, and like it's similar to how like, okay, like the Office of War Mobilization, which was created in 1943, was, it was, it's another example, which is similar to like the purpose that the War Industries Board served in World War I. Good. Okay. He also received full support from Americans after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, because as soon as they bombed Pearl Harbor, then he, they, that's when we entered the war. And Americans were outraged by the loss, the extreme number of losses. So you're saying that loss essentially gave the president a blank check, if you will, to do what he needed to do at all right. costs? Right. And okay. they were supportive of them, him entering the war. Okay. The That's fair. Right. Right. And it's going to start the line. So we're going to start with Alexis. Alexis is going to give us one reason why the use of the atomic bomb on, on Japan was necessary. Then she'll come over here to Ashley. She'll give us an argument why it was unnecessary and back and forth. Back and forth. <laughs> Remember, as it goes along, once that point's repeated, you can't repeat it more than once. You've got to come up with a new reason. So it gets more difficult as we go towards the back of the line. <laughs> At the end, Hannah, you must tell us which side is more persuasive for you. And then not, you're saying it was necessary and not excessive. You guys are saying it was unnecessary and excessive. 
Are y'all ready? No. Oh, this will be good. All right, let's go. Okay. So it was necessary because Japan was sitting there and they kept fighting. They had this extreme pride for their country, so they wouldn't give up. They had already been beaten out of Manchuria and they weren't going to give up for their own island that they had fought over in the first place. All right, and well, this is called the Tunnel of Truth. And, like, to, like, uh, and, like, and, and they're like, always, uh, there's always a great deal of trepidation like, over it, uh, the, the Tunnel of Truth, but they actually, so they always ask for it whenever we're not doing it, so I know they like it. Uh, essentially, it gives them an idea. Well, it forces them to possibly take a position that they don't feel comfortable with. And they need to recognize that sometimes they have to argue a position that may not be their own and to see the other side of, of issues as well. But for the person who's passing through the tunnel of truth, it also compels them to, to take a stand. I typically tip, uh, choose, for example, a student who may be someone who typically is on the fence with issues in class, who maybe have a, may have a hard time making a decisions. It forces that person to come to a conclusion. That was not it was not accidental that I chose that particular student. But once again, it's always good to see after they come through, she, she finished strong. She clearly knew what she believed. She had a reasoning. Uh, I was really proud of her. Uh, this act class actually has it pretty good because they're small. I have a couple of classes which are in their 20s, which uh, that can be very difficult. But it, again, it also presses the critical reasoning skill because, and also listening, because you have to think about what's not been said and where can I get my argument in. Ammo and fuel eventually, they, they would have deteriorated and eventually had to surrender. We wouldn't, there was no need for that level of destruction. <laughs> um, kind of adding on to what I think it was Sydney or maybe it was Lexus, I don't remember whoever said the war in Europe was already over like they were already ending and you still have all these troops over in Asia trying to fight Japan it's taking forever and everybody else is like dude we're going home like why are you guys still in Japan and they're like you know what you're right we need to speed things up let's just bomb them because you gotta end it faster That's right. That's home. Right. That's good. Okay, so the U.S. Navy was overpowering Japan, totally. And so the Navy wouldn't be able to compete with, with the U.S. Even though Japan kept going, eventually they wouldn't be able to compete at all, and the Navy just demolished Japan. Okay. So. Okay. All right. It was necessary as a way to show that they couldn't attack the U.S. again, like they did in Pearl Harbor. Oh. So yeah. way to... That's good! Oh. <laughs> like, yeah, no. <laughs> that was a good one. Um, I guess Hitler died already, and they just excessively blew everyone else up. I don't know. I think they're my only one. All right, all right. I honestly don't have that much to say for this. I guess. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Um, well, the war was already over, and they didn't. I guess they didn't want any more conflict with Japan and um, Russia, so they just bombed Japan. So it's a way of ending it. Yes. It. Okay. Final okay. 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 Okay this amount of time more and extend the war. Okay, this is good. Excellent argumentation. Here's a question I would pose. Another argument you guys could have gone with that maybe one bomb was necessary, but two would have been excessive. That's what oh, I said. That's, that's what I said. That could have been an interesting <laughs> argument on this side as well. Know, you think two, two were okay? I don't know, because then you cut out from all their will to live. Like okay. you cut off so all they their will. They said something about they have put in prior investments to, to you know, use the bomb on, um, I think it was Germany. Germany. Yeah, yeah, prior. So in that sense, I felt like it was kind of excessive in the sense that they were just it, the I, the idea was oh we didn't use it in, you didn't use it in Germany it's ready now might as well use it you know that kind of thing just mm -hmm. that that made it sound kind of excessive and unnecessary to me. Interesting. Okay, one, two, three. You got to move on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just want to emphasize that that's a million brothers, husbands. You know that and Truman was thinking of the American people and you're gonna send a million. That you don't, a million people to die, even though they don't really necessarily die, when you have this weapon that you can use to just end the war as fast Application as possible. Application of pathos. Okay. Right. Uh, if those. I was on that side, I would have made the point that oh they put God. sanctions <laughs> on Germany to control it, 
and that led uh, that led Germany to being uh, controlled by Hitler and expanding and eventually actually leading to World War II. So if and if we had put like a finishing blow to Germany, like say a nuclear bomb, it might not have occurred like it did. Okay, that's fair. Okay. So could you say that it like displayed the U.S. as a power? Just I mean, it showed off. Was it a symbolic know? event? Yeah. So Absolutely. like, look at us, we have a bomb. I, I would think that when that last question we dealt with on your study guide, ways in which it showed us being a superpower, I think that's exactly what uh, one of the key, key moments were. Good. I got your seats. Good job, folks. Uh, excellent discussion, folks. So far, so good here. Here's the question of the day. Assess the Allied, the U.S.'s contribution to the Allied effort during World War II. I think it's a very manageable question. And I think the way to group this, there's a very clear way. But I'm going to get your take on this first. Assess the United States' contribution to the Allied effort during World War II. All right, with the person next to you, I want you to take about four to five minutes here to think about how you would attack this question. Then we will come back together as a large group and figure it out. States to have uh, the, the leaders like Pat and you have Bradley. Bradley was key, especially in North Africa, to bringing out the end of uh, the North African campaign. Should you see this question on the ACE exam, uh, I would definitely go for it. I think it'd be a very manageable question, one that you could easily write. Uh, this, of course, as always, could be the sticking point, the assessment part of it. But I think it's a very uh, manageable question, and it's been a while since we've seen this. But how would we go about organizing this question? Uh, based on what you've, the feedback you've given me, uh, of course, there's always the possibility of doing the ESP method, the economic, social, political. Uh, some of you are thinking geographic, uh, geographically here, breaking it up into theaters, Europe versus Japan. And then I'm also seeing thematically as well, and this is the kind of the way that I did it whenever I thought about this question, uh, in terms of a paragraph on le leadership, economic assistance, and total warfare. But I'm not sure in terms of how if we did that in terms of the assessment part of it. We'd have to think about that. I want to try, we're going to chase that down, see if it'll work. Yeah. Uh, how did you want to argue total warfare? Like, how, how was that a contribution? Well, it's been said that while the British gave their time, the Russians gave their blood, blood. we gave our money. money. Yes. That, I would say, is probably the most important contribution we make, our total war industry effort. Oh. So, are you saying, like, one paragraph to talk about like production of tanks and then cash and carry and lend and lease and all that? Well, let's see here. Or let's see what we have, we'll, we'll, what would come up here. All right, so let's say we had a paragraph on total warfare. Uh, I would want to focus on here troops, arms, and of course, land and water vehicles. In terms of aircraft carrier, destroyers, things like that. But also the fact that you had such a, a large supply of people involved in the war in the US effort as well. So the total we're going to say it aided to the contribution to the allies, like it aided the allies. Like the only counter thing could we say is that maybe socially the U.S. suffered because it put on a, what was, it, what was that term that you said? Um, they didn't have enough, they couldn't, they couldn't do everything that they wanted. What was yeah. it, it called? Uh, yes. Would you... In that setup, would you talk about like morale 
because they uh, Europe had already been in the war for three years when America kind of started uh, officially contributing. It must have been a morale. Like well, morale see, and there's the other way you can deal with this. And y'all are kind of going in this direction here, which, which I think is, is interesting. It's almost a long-term, term, short-term. You could do, and this would be a different take on it, pre-1941, post-1941. Well, does that count as during World War I, though? We were well, when we start, well, when we start in World War II? When's your starting date? But for, for an after, you would have to define, could you include the Reconstruction period when they had to rebuild Europe? I mean, why couldn't we include the 19, late 1930s, whenever? 1937, like, Japan and China. Uh, why not? Yeah. Wouldn't that approach have to be based upon, like, what <coughs> time period do you believe in the world? That's exactly right, which raises the question raised at the very beginning of class, when does World War II actually start? Which allows you to really play with this question in a large, large degree, do a short-term, long-term kind of approach. You could make the case that whereas in the early period, pre-1942 or whatever, our, uh, our aid was primarily with respect to economic aid, cash and carry, lend-lease, destroyer bill. The later period, total warfare and leadership plays a role. Let, let's see if this works out. Economic assistance, right? In our endeavor to remain isolationist here, we are not exactly physically involved. So once again, lend lease, old cash and carry, and the destroyer bill, which we essentially unpack a bunch of our World War I destroyers and send them to Britain. And then leadership. I think you have to have a paragraph in some way dealing with leadership. And here, what do you want to focus on in terms of people? Or who do you want to focus on in terms of people? Eisenhower. Good. So, excellent. So I like the fact that you guys aren't just thinking in terms of presidential leadership, which we need to. We're also thinking in terms of generalship as well. So presidential leadership, but also generalship also. Which there you can raise an interesting question. What was more important toward, who was more important towards running the war? Was it FDR's effort to nationalize industry or would the generals have done it themselves? Was FDR essential to the war? Yeah. It feels a lot like the Lincoln question. Yes, it does. Um, I, would, I would say that they have to both be present. Without without the without total warfare in the uh, United States supplying the generals with what they needed when they needed it, it doesn't matter how well the leadership was, they wouldn't have been able to win. So FDR's presence then sounds mm -hmm. essential in terms of his willingness to extend executive power. But if they had someone uh, leading the troops, someone like Grant with only full frontal assault, no maneuvering of the troops, so you he also you have been mass losses of just not just the money but of the men and all the resources. So the Eisenhowers, the Pattons, the Nimitz in, in Pacific, those generals there was a payoff by having those great figures involved. Okay, yes. Because I thought, I, isn't it more like presidents like attainment of like more like an extension of federal power enabled them to like replace ships as like fast as they were being sunk by the German U-boats and so in that sense it provided them with the resources they needed. So it sounds like you're actually leaning more towards presidentials. I mean, this kind of goes to me reminds me more of the Grant question. If Grant doesn't have troops, is he great? No. I mean, if, if these generals don't have the stuff at their disposal, are they as great as a... Is Patton great if he doesn't have the tanks? Well, no. Is but a coach great if he... Yeah, a coach is only his greatest team. Okay. Well, you could use, like, well, Lee and her, Lee towards the end, how long he lasted without all the necessary supplies that he had. He lasted a lot longer than everyone thought. So, I mean, if, he, if you're a good leader, you can find somehow to win, even if you don't have the supplies. Okay. He didn't win. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I ever said you're. I'm just okay, but it's it's not a it's not the question of like how long can you last at those advice, you know, the question of can you be successful without effectiveness. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. So there's a way you could assess that in terms of leadership. Uh, who played the the greater role in the Allied effort here? I think overall, though, I really like y'all's approach in, in terms of thinking. When does World War II? When's your starting point? If it's Poland. Uh, then again, you could make the case that early on we were simply 
we were, our, our contribution was fairly limited to economics. But post um, Pearl Harbor, that's really where we begin to see, well, probably our greatest contributions are going to be our total warfare effort with our, our troops, our armaments, things like that. So I think I, I like that division there. That's good stuff. Yeah. I just had a thought popped in my head about uh, Roosevelt. He was also key in keeping the alliance together with Churchill and yeah, Stalin. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think yeah, I think we can under underplay that because once he dies, Truman essentially falls apart in many cases. That's good stuff. All right, folks, we leave in about three minutes. I need a thesis statement. And then we'll wrap it up. And there we go, folks. Yeah, I'll turn it in. Take it up. Uh, put it on a separate sheet of paper, please. A thesis statement for this question here. Yeah. I'll take it up. Make sure your name's on it. Excellent job today, folks. Yeah, in terms of how I drew to the overarching question here, the idea was to, I like to think about each class as a funnel. We're going to start large, and we're going to work down to a topic. So we started off the class thinking about just World War II in general. And then we got to thinking about the U.S.'s role in World War II. And then we really came to the most important topic of what was our contribution in World War II, or to assess that, the key word being to assess, not just give me those points, of how we involved ourselves, but I needed them to make it an argument on what parts were we, on what parts were our contributions the most important. And again, that's when I'm pressing them beyond just the what's and thinking about the why's, if you will. Uh,